enemies of love. We are cracking open a section of Luke's gospel in which Jesus commands us. Surely, you know, everybody says, oh, I just love Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. Even people who don't really follow Jesus, they say, what a nice teacher and everything. Uh, if you take this at all seriously, it's a pretty shocking and even to some sensibilities, offensive command from Jesus. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Love your enemies. We're talking about gospel love today. And gospel love is the heart of God's gospel for his glory and for the salvation of your soul. See, I'm concerned today about the state of your soul. Is your soul united with Jesus Christ? As you head to eternity, will your soul be united and renewed in Jesus Christ? We have to deal with the real threats to our soul, and it turns out we'll come back and dig deep, more deeply into this passage probably over the next couple Sundays, but, but this passage, as we open it up, and the initial command from Jesus confronts us with the reality that the real threats to our souls, the real threat to your soul, is not other people you call enemies. Oh, I know they can do bad things to you, but that's not the real issue. The real threat, the real threats are external and internal, guess what? What would you fill in the blank there? If you're following along in the sermon notes, how are you filling that in? What, what do you put in there? The, the real threats to our souls are not other people that we call enemies, but external and internal enemies of love. That's our sermon title for today, Enemies of Love. Let's take a step back as we prepare to turn to God's word and remind ourselves this. Gospel love, love in the gospel, and in fact, throughout the New Testament, really in, in, throughout the Old Testament too, love is primarily a what? Verb. Love is primarily a verb. Love is used predominantly in the Bible. It's also used as a noun. It's used adverbally, adjectivally, but it's primarily huge supermajority. Love is action. And it's not, it's not just like, well, I'll get a nice feeling in myself for somebody else. In the Bible, what it's talking about is action. God doesn't just hang out on a cloud in heaven and say, well, I kind of love the world. I'm going to like change my heart about the world and you guys just go on and go on to hell. No, God so loved the world that he did what? He acted ultimately. He gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish. Love is a verb. Gospel love is a verb. Self-giving love in action. The main verb for godly love, you know this from Wednesday night studies we've done recently and other times, agapeo, agape. Um, it's it's self-sacrificial, self-giving love in action. And according to the gospel and according to Jesus, this is extended to enemies. And this is the heart of God's gospel call to Christians, the heart of how we're saved, Jesus is coming and saving us, and the heart of any truly saved and sanctified, regenerated Christ follower. If you're born again in Jesus, if you're born again in the Spirit, then this is your heart. Godly, self-sacrificial love, even, yes, extending to enemies. But let me go ahead and put a, a clarifier on this. I'll probably put this every time we read this kind of passage. Um, let me make this very clear. Jesus' command is not a call for individual Christians to condone or to subject themselves. If you're in an abusive, destructive situation, if the terrorists are proposing to knock down your door and come in and you know, rape and pillage in your own house, that, that is not what this command is talking about. This is not about condoning or subjecting yourself, wives, husbands, in domestic situations of abuse. I'm telling you, this is not about subjecting yourself 
to, um, and those who are under your care, God forbid, to domestic abuse, to terrorism, and to criminal acts. That's not what this command is talking about. Jesus gives this command to us. Let me go ahead and give this command to you and break it out a little bit for you. It is second person plural all the way. Jesus is calling us as the, I'm going to use some fancy words now, the eschatological kingdom of God people, okay, as the church that he's forming, the new covenant people, to together as a body and as the light to the world to love our enemies. This is not about somebody having to go solo into a horrible, abusive situation. So that's my disclaimer on this as we head into this. Jesus says, but I say to you, that's second person plural. I say to you who hear, love, agapete. Okay, that's second person person plural imperative command it's to us together as a people and yes as individual christians we're supposed to live this out but again not in an abusive situation or a criminal situation love your enemies do good again imperative second person plural to those who hate you now let's turn to this passage of scripture that we open up today that we'll continue to work our way through as we uh, close out this month and head in the next. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 36. Hear now God's word. And he, Jesus, lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are the hungry now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who are the weeping now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people will hate you, exclude you, revile you, spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is or will be great in heaven, because so their fathers treated the prophets the same. Yet woe to you who are rich, for you have received your, your comfort. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, because so their fathers treated the false prophets the same. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Second person plural now to one who strikes you on the cheek offer the other also and from one who takes away your cloak do not withhold your tunic either give to everyone who asks of you and from one who takes away uh, what is yours do not demand it back and as you wish that others would do to you do to them likewise if you love those who love you what credit literally grace is that to you for even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit, literally grace, is that to you? For even the sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit, what grace, is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good to them and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil be merciful even as your father is merciful this is the word of the lord thanks be to god friends the grass withers the flowers fade but the word of our god will stand forever amen Today, we're going to ask and seek to answer how. How does Jesus command us to act in following him? If we're going to be disciples, if we're going to be Christians, if we're going to follow Jesus, how does Jesus command us to act? How did Jesus save us? And how does he now lead us in righteousness and restoring our souls? Um, also, we're going to open our eyes to, as I've already mentioned, who or what opposes our trusting and following Jesus 
in this way, in gospel love for our enemies. And why? Why can we follow Jesus' command? Why can we? Now, let's go back to this again. How, first of all, does Jesus command us to act following him? How, secondly, did Jesus save us? And third, how does he now lead us in righteousness and restore our souls? Okay, first of all, how does Jesus command us to act following him? He commands us to act, as we've already introduced, in gospel love. And again, that means action. That's not just like kind of feeling a little bit better about somebody. He commands us to act in love. Self-giving love in action. Sacrificial love in action. Extended even to enemies is the heart of God's gospel call for us as Christians. Now, uh, let me put up for you, I think we can put up for you just to juxtapose, and it's, it's in your sermon notes as well, uh, the, from the Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls community, that central command for their community as they withdrew from the fallen world and the corrupt temple system and everything else to try to be faithful to God. The command is, fear, is very clear from, from the, the, the initial scrolls. Hate all the sons of darkness. You are the sons of light, so hate the sons of darkness. Now, that sounds like that would resonate in social media today, doesn't it? That sounds to me like this would be a lot more popular if you said, I follow Jesus, the one who says, hate all the sons of darkness. Then we all get to decide who the sons of darkness are, and we get to hate on them, and we get a lot of energy out of that hate, and we, I'm on the good side, and I'm against all these other people, and I hate them. Well, you know, you want to move out to the Dead Sea to uh, live, you know, and store some scrolls in some caves? You can be that person. That's not Jesus. Notice the juxtaposition here. Jesus' command in radical contradiction to the Essenes and to other zealots of various spiritual stripes and political stripes is love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Uh, what's going on here? Nobody would, of their own flesh, vote for that command. Let's just be honest. I mean, nobody's looking for that command. Um, per, I'm just going to give you some. These are not evangelical folks. These are high scholarly folks from the last you know, 50, 60 years who've studied this extensively. Victor Furnish, in his magisterial love command, says, this command of Jesus to love your enemies most of all sets Jesus' ethic of love apart from other love ethics of antiquity. In other words, this is unique, going to this extreme. Yes, I know we get the non-reciprocation, you know, high-level stuff in the Old Testament, like a passage in Proverbs, and what happens sometimes when people are being really good, but you never get to this extreme, where the love of the neighbor is carried out to the love of the enemy. I mean, you know, Jesus blows open the love of the neighbor to, you're supposed to be, we'll get to this later in Luke, you're supposed to be the neighbor to everybody, but he takes it all the way out to actively loving your enemies. Nobody, nobody in antiquity does that. Nobody now on social media is probably promoting that, that you're aware of, right? It's like, I, my side's right, and I hate these other people. They're trying to kill us. Um, so this sets Jesus off totally. And it's obviously, actually, the early Christians didn't know what to do with this because nobody naturally likes this command. Um, Jürgen Becker, again, not an evangelical, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus brings a totally new orientation of love. And definitely, I'm not, a, I'm not commending to you to read Bultmann, but I can just tell you, you know, major figure, the major New Testament theologian, not an evangelical in the center of the 20th century, Rudolf Bultmann, actually gets this very much right, Jesus and the Word. Jesus' command, love your enemies, is the high point, the high point of overcoming of self, the surrender of one's own claim. Remember my sermon from a couple weeks ago, empty yourself? This hyper connects with that. This is going on with this command. And by the way, Martin Leifer here would be my summary here. This love command of Jesus is Jesus' crucible command for refining believers as God's children in order to glorify God as real kingdom people. You want to be a real Jesus follower? 
just start turning, repenting, and coming to him on this command about loving your enemies. We're going to see the same kind of dynamic, of course, with his command to us to forgive people who've wronged us. Uh, who and what opposes our doing this, our trusting in Jesus and following his gospel command for us to love our enemies? In other words, who are our real enemies? It turns out it's not the people out there. They, they may try to disrupt our faith with Jesus, but they're not the major, major league enemies. Because Jesus is calling us to love them and even in the face of their enmity. Um, so who are the real enemies? Love your enemies. Christ's command takes us to the crucible of the refining fire, and the refining fire exposes what's really going on in our hearts and souls, okay? In other words, what I'm saying is, if you start getting anywhere close to the cross, this stuff is going to start getting exposed. I, I don't, I'm not just talking about talking about the cross. I'm actually talking about coming to the cross and the crucible and the refining fire. Um, neither are human enemies nor unfaithful bad influence, friends and family who say, oh, don't do that stuff, or you're being, becoming fanatical or whatever. I know they can be a problem, but there are forces beyond them, outside of us and inside of us, that are the real issue, the main problem. Remember Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. So we can go ahead and name one of the real enemies to our loving our enemies, and that's Satan. Satan is totally against the command, love your enemies. He's like, take them all out. Kill some more. This is awesome. I'm always, I'm always just in it for myself, and if I can get you guys to just be in it for yourself and your side, man, I am going to take over the world. This is beautiful. Satan is definitely against you loving your enemies. Jesus commands you to love your enemies. Satan is against it. But beyond Satan, what gives Satan a foothold into us? Well, we know things like sin and anger do. So let's just unpack a few of those. I just laid them out for you. Selfishness and sin. Satan and the forces of evil are going to love it if you're selfish. Because if you're selfish, you're not going to come anywhere close to loving your enemies. No way. And Satan's like, good, good, good. Let's dance together selfishness and sin. Uh, as John says in 1 John 2, um, the uber-charging of sin, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life and possessions. That can be translated either way, pride of life, pride of possessions. That's going to drive me to really protect my own and hate my enemies. Fear and anxiety. The next things I'm getting to are really going to pop up with the Beatitudes and the woes, which is why I included those in here. Fear and anxiety. Anger. Remember, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the devil have a foothold, right, in your soul. You stay angry, devil's like, all right, we can dance together, baby. You're angry. That's, that's what I like to work with. Have more enmity. Anger, hatred, and, of course, the flip side of that, depression. Guilt, shame, needing to prove myself, needing to justify. Guilt, shame, and self-hatred. And again, our Qumran friends hate all the sons of darkness. But Jesus says, love your enemies. Now, I'm reminded of John Duncan's famous trilemma confronting us with Jesus' assertions of being divine, the Son of God. Duncan calls it a trilemma. Watchman Nee also refers to this issue, this trilemma. And then C.S. Lewis in the 20th century gave the great tagline of the, the three L's, right? Which is, with Jesus claiming to be what he claims to be, you have to make a decision. Everybody has to make a decision. You can't just say, well, he's a nice teacher. If he is claiming to do what he can do, forgive sins, be the son of God, tell you to love your enemies, right? I'll come back to that in a minute. Then he is either a liar. He's lying about being divine and having all this authority, speaking for himself, not referring to other authorities. He's either a liar 
or he's a lunatic, or he is the Lord. You are confronted. Everybody in history is confronted with this choice. That's the famous trilemma. Um, similarly, regarding Jesus' upside-down beatitudes, woes, and enemy love commands. And I can tell you that skeptics and critical scholars question whether some of the divine affirmations of Jesus are real or not, actually happened or not. I believe that they are. I can talk to you about that in other studies and other, you know, sermons. But let's just move on to even skeptics, even the Jesus seminar people from the late last century who basically excised a whole lot of the gospel sayings, they all acknowledge, just like they acknowledge the crucifixion. This is embarrassing and odd, the crucifixion, and this Jesus command, which went beyond anything anybody said back then, to love your enemies is clearly from whoever this Jesus of Nazareth is. The skeptics, the cynics, the Jesus seminar people all acknowledge this is from Jesus, and the early church didn't know what to do with this. They tried to run away from it, but they couldn't help it because it was central to his teaching. Got me? Okay, so if that's the case, which it is, we're faced with this multiple dilemma now. Is Jesus a cynic? Because cynics in the Greco-Roman world in the Hellenistic world, they turn things upside down. So is that all he's being? He's just trying to kind of shock value people? Is he just a cynic? Is he a flighty mystic? He doesn't deal with reality. He doesn't deal with reality so he can tell us to love our enemies because he doesn't know what it is to be in the real world. Is that who he is? He's either a cynic, he's a flighty mystic that we can't really relate to, or he is a lunatic, he's crazy, telling us to love our enemies and do good to them. Do you realize what that would mean? What that would expose us to? Or, he's an inspired prophet. We could go to that and say, maybe he is an inspired prophet. But wait a minute, notice, he never says, thus saith the Lord. He never quotes from other scripture. He doesn't even go back to like Proverbs and what Elijah and Elisha did and kind of elaborate on that here. He just flat out says it like he is God because he is God. Love your enemies do good to those who hate you. So you're ultimately faced with this question, is he the king and the one who will judge us in the end, or is he not? If he is the king and the one who will judge you on the final day, then you better pay attention to his command. Christ's command then takes us to the crucible of the cross. So let's go there. How did Jesus himself save us? For God so loved, did you hear that? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever, whichever enemy of God believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans chapter 5, we turn to this in the assurance of pardon, the second part of this. Let's go back there now. But God, is Romans 5 verse 8, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, the New Testament is clear on this. Paul is clear on this. He's going to come back and double down on this in a couple of verses. If you are a sinner, you are acting in rebellion against God and God's authority. So you're an enemy of God. Any sinner is an enemy of God. Do we have any sinners here today among us? So Jesus died for people who were sinners, who were enemies of his father and of himself. Got that? But then let's go, it gets even more clear with verse 10, the opening of it. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, So Jesus, when you were his enemy, in ultimate love, loved his enemies and did the ultimate good for those who hated, hated him and his father's rule. You can say, I love God, but the truth is, if you're disobedient to God, you're actually hating on God, okay? You're serving other gods. You're serving money. You're serving whatever, your own pleasure. Self-giving love in action extended even to enemies. That's how Jesus saved you. In other words, he's not asking you to do anything that he has not already broken the door open on. (laughs) He's already forged the way through on this, and it's how you're saved. 
how does he now lead us in righteousness and restore our souls? And for that matter, why? Why can we? Why should we and why can we follow Jesus' command? Well, let's go and just kind of read Psalm 23 in reflection with the Beatitudes and with this love command. Like I said, this is just a kind of overview introduction here. We are called, and I invite you, to follow God's loving call, his word. Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, I want to invite you to pray that you will hear Jesus and hear this command. He's speaking to you. He's calling you to the cross and to the crucible of salvation and sanctification here. That's, that's what's going on. Hear his voice. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. How did Middle Eastern shepherds operate all through the biblical times and even many of them to this day? They operate by, not by sheep dogs, not by tractors, <laughs> They operate by voice call. The sheep, my, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. That's John chapter 10. So in other words, if you're going to say the Lord is my shepherd, that means I listen to his voice and I, I, I tune out everybody else's voice and I listen to his voice and follow him. And Jesus is saying, I want you to hear me. Love your enemies. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I personally would not go in the path of righteousness. I definitely would not naturally go in the path of loving my enemies and doing good to those who hate me. But Jesus is calling me there. So follow him. Listen to him. Follow him. Follow his voice, his word. Fear not. Don't be afraid for lack, for wanting, for poverty. Jesus says this, blessed are you, the faithful ones, who are the poor. If you're poor, if you're impoverished from your faithfulness unto me, yours is the kingdom of God. You already have the kingdom. And David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I follow his voice, not anybody else's voice, and so I shall not want. I don't have to, I don't have to be anxious about stuff. I really don't. If I know him and listen to his voice, I want to invite you to that kind of peace and strength and power. I shall not want. My cup overflows. I have got more than I need. I'm not worried about protecting things. It all comes from God. He's going to provide for me. Fear not for lack in the sense of hunger. Blessed are you who are the hungry now. Blessed are you who hunger. For you shall be fed, Jesus, Jesus says. You will be filled. You will be filled. You, you will be. I, I promise it. It's going to happen. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Do you believe that? I, I don't do it. He does it. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I don't have to worry about hunger. You prepare a table before me. You're the one who does it, Lord. I I'm in with you. And then I invite you to fear not death. This is a big one now. Fear not death and the grief that comes with your own death and with others' death, and also the grieving over the fact that the world has fallen and broken and people are a mess, okay? Blessed are you who are the weeping now, the faithful who are the weeping now for the broken world and for the, the, the pains of being faithful, for you shall laugh. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear not, evil, enemies, rejection, and harm. Jesus says this, blessed are you when people will hate you, exclude you, revile you, because you're, 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 you're with me, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice, leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. Do you believe that? 
that you can give up friendships, that you can give up things here because you're going to get more. I mean, you're going to get the bountiful <laughs> blessings forever in eternity. David says, I will fear no evil because you are with me. If I have God with me, I don't have to fear anything. Do you believe that? Do you believe in him? You don't need to be afraid of anything if he's with you. Fellowship with the Lord in the presence of my enemies. Now, here are these things really come together. The love command and the prophetic psalm of Psalm 22, which, of course, follows from the crucifixion psalm of Psalm 22. You all remember this, right? Psalm 22, crucifixion psalm, right? Prophecy a thousand years before the crucifixion. Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But let me come back to this issue. Why can't I live with the Lord? Why and how can I know I will dwell with him forever? Because God's own son himself came down, took on our flesh, and fulfilled perfectly the love command, the way of the cross in which he now calls me. Do you believe him? Will you come with him? I can know I'll live in the house forever because Jesus has already loved me and loved you and other enemies of God that much that he would redeem us. He would go through the cross for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Let me read you all of Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's how you're saved. That's how you're brought to God. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. You're in the process of being saved unto Christ by this same enemy love that he gave for your salvation. You live in the power of that enemy love. You live in the power of what Jesus has done for you. Much more than that, that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. He went through it and he lives again. He's raised and he is ascendant and he is the Lord over heaven and earth. And so I can say for sure with David, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I can say as Jesus promises me, yours is the kingdom of God. Love your enemies and you will be sons of the most high. I want to invite you today, in other words, to the real Jesus, to the real gospel all the way. Come to him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.